Can you imagine being on a seashore and Jesus Christ is teaching the Bible to you? I mean, that, that, that's exactly what goes on in Luke 5. I want you to turn there real quick. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus Christ is on the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee there in Israel, and there's a whole group of people that have gathered together to hear Jesus teach the Bible. And in Luke 5, you'll notice there verse number 1, Luke 5, and if you're using the uh, church Bible there in front of you, we always put the page number there for you, page 1062, will take you to Luke chapter 5 because we want you to see it in God's Word here at Crossroads. Look at Luke 5, verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the Word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. That's the Sea of Galilee. And verse 2 says, He saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And then the Bible says that he enters into one of the ships, which was Simon's. That's Simon Peter. And he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down, and he taught the people out of the ship. So imagine this platform is this big fishing boat, right? You guys are out on the shore. So Jesus Christ is out here, and the Bible says he's in this, this boat, he's in this ship, and he sat down, and he taught the people out of the boat. And they're all gathered around like you, and they're listening to Jesus as he teaches the Bible. Well, when he gets done teaching, all of a sudden now he's going to direct his attention to Peter, and he's going to kind of really put Peter on the spot. Look at verse number four. It says, now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. That means a big catch, right? Big catch of fish. And so Simon's been out all night fishing. Look at verse 5. Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've toiled all the night. We've been up all night. We've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So it's decision time. Is Peter going to take a risk? Is it, and is he going to launch out into the deep? Like you see the banner here, launch out into the deep with Christ. Is he going to do that? Or is he going to be like this? And is he going to kind of play it safe on the shore? And say, no, not today. No, I don't think it's a good time. I've been up all night. What's he going to do, see? And, and we said last week that God wants to take us into deeper waters in our, in our walk with him. Because sometimes what can happen is we can get kind of shallow. We get in shallow waters in our prayer life, in our Bible study, maybe shallow waters in our faithfulness, shallow waters in our giving, in our Christian service, witnessing, sharing our faith. And it kind of speaks of shallow water Christianity. And the call here is to launch out into the deep. Launch out and let down your nets. And so now Peter's put on the spot and he's got to make a decision. Well, he goes. And look at verse number 6. It says, And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break, and they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. And Simon, Simon Peter saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter's like, you are exactly who you said you are. You are the Son of God. You are the Lord. You are the Messiah of Israel. Nobody could have dominion over fish like that except the Messiah. And so Peter by faith, recognizes who he is. But I want, what I want you to see is that none of that would have happened had Peter not been willing to go into the deep waters with Jesus Christ. He had to launch out, and he had to go out into the deep. And God, as I said, wants to take you, friend, into deeper waters in 2017. It's in the deep waters is where the action is, and that's where the thrill of seeing God at work is. And so last week, you remember that we used the illustration. In fact, I've, I brought it back in this week kind of just as a visual, just to see and to test to see if you guys would, uh, would remember this. And uh, you remember last week we said that, you know, you can, whoa, you can talk about it all day long, but there comes a point when, the, when we said you've got to get into the boat, and you have to pick up the oars, and you remember what we said? You got to launch out. Wow, that's pretty good. Wow. That's, I'm impressed. I really am. You got to. There comes a point where you've got to. You got to say, you know, enough of this shallow water. Enough of this planet safe on the shore. I got to launch out. I got to get serious about this thing. 
Because you only get one go-around in life. Have you all noticed that? You only get one chance at it. There's no reruns, no replay. You get one chance. Peter had a chance. He launched out. What's it going to take to launch out? What's it going to take to do that? Well, number one, in your handout, we said, what was the, what was the very first thing we said it's going to take? And we, we, we covered that one word last week. What was that word? C- commitment. It's going to take commitment. And I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time reviewing. I don't have time. But I, I do want to... Um, I do want to bring out one thing that I said last week, and I, and I want you to remember this, is that your life, your life, and really your 2017, is going to be shaped by the commitments that you choose to make. Your life is shaped by the commitments you choose to make. Show me a person's top five commitments, and I'll tell you all about that person. Their real commitment. Not what they say, but what their real commitments are. You see... As you look back over your past, you can see how your life's already been shaped by commitments. And the good thing about that is every day you can reevaluate. Every day you can look at it afresh and anew. Every day you can make decisions. And you can make commitments. You can refine your commitments. And that's literally going to shape and define your life and your future. It's going to help define your 2017. God wants to take you into deep waters spiritually, but it's going to take a commitment. Your commitment level has to be there. But there's a second key word I want to give you, and here it is. You ready? I want you to write this in your handout. Let's bring it up on the screen. Everybody say it with me. What is it? Obedience. We sung about it, right? Trust and obey. Yeah, if I am committed and I'm trusting, then I'm going to obey. Obedience. It's interesting that when Christ finished speaking God's word to the crowd, he turns to Peter. Now, now I want you to get the picture. Remember, this is the boat. I'm in the boat. And Jesus Christ is done teaching. And all of a sudden now he's going to turn to Peter. Peter's in the boat somewhere. And he turns and he says to Peter, I got two things I want you to do, Peter. Look at verse number four. I'll show you what they are. Verse four. Now, when he had left speaking... He said unto Simon, launch out into the deep, and number two, let down your nets. Commitment, which was our first point, was essential. But Christ made it clear to Peter what his commitment would entail. He said, you know what your commitment's going to look like, Peter? You need to launch out into the deep and let down your net. So Peter had heard God's word, now he has a chance to obey God's word. You see, God's word, most of you have a a copy of the Bible in your lap right now. That's a blessing. A lot of countries don't have that. They can't hardly get a copy of the Bible. But you're blessed in that you have a copy of the Bible probably in your lap right now or next to you or in the, uh, the seat in front of you. There's a copy of God's holy word. You see, God's word is not sitting in your lap and it's not sitting on this pulpit in order to give us just warm and fuzzy feelings. It's not there to entertain us. It's not there to soothe our conscience. It's not even there to give us an academic understanding so that we can out-argue people and show them how smart we are. The Bible is given for one primary purpose. In your handout, it says it is given to change our lives. And move us to action. You know, there's a motto that we have at Crossroads that you will see on our logo most everywhere. In fact, I had a guest this week I visited, Denise and I. He, he was in the 830 service again this morning. Uh, but but he, he was telling us that he said, I noticed your motto and I really liked it. And here it is. Let's bring it up on the screen. Can you say it with me? What's our motto at Crossroads? Learning the Bible, living the Bible. I love that motto. Because I can't live it if I don't learn it. And a lot of churches aren't teaching the Bible anymore today. But you, and you know, you can't live it if you don't learn it. But guess what? Can you learn it and not live it? Yes or no? Yes. God gave us to us to learn it so that it would change our life. So that we could go out and then live it. In your handout, James essentially said that, right? Look at your handout, James 1. He says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the Bible, and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be what, church? 
blessed in his deed. If Peter does not by faith obey Christ, this miracle never happens out there in the deep. And Christ leaves the boat when it comes to shore. Christ leaves the boat, he walks away from Peter, and Peter's life is unchanged. It is unchanged. You say, you mean that really could have happened? I mean, Peter could have just disobeyed the Lord? Absolutely. We all have a free will. And, and come up here, Caleb, real quick. I'm going to let Caleb come and help me. I know Caleb just loves to act. Come on up here, Caleb. This is Caleb. And Caleb, uh, Caleb is, you're going to be Jesus. Come on up. You get to play the good guy, all right? Come on up here. You, you're Jesus. And Jesus, I'm Peter. And Jesus turns around to Peter and he says to Peter, we didn't, practice, we didn't practice this ahead of time. This is totally extemporaneous. He said, launch out and let down your net. All right. And he said to Peter. Launch out and let down your net. <laughs> Isn't that great? All right. <laughs> when he said, launch out into the deep and let down your net, Peter could have very well said, Jesus, look, I have enjoyed your teaching. I've listened. I've been polite. I've let you use my boat. But that's taking a little bit far. I have been up all night long. This is the worst time of the day to fish. I'm not going to go on a wild goose or a wild fish chase. And so I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I like you. I may even listen to you another time, but I'm going home and I am going to bed. No, I'm not going to be made a fool of in front of all these people. I'll see you, Jesus. I'm going home. And Peter could have walked away and never saw that miracle in the deep. He could have walked away with his life unchanged. And Jesus would have walked the opposite direction away. What an opportunity Peter would have missed had he not obeyed. You can walk away, Jesus. Thank you. (laughs) I appreciate that. Thank you, Caleb. You see, you mean that could have happened? Turn your hand out over. I want to show you a verse. Look Look at this verse, Matthew 13, 58. Just to show you how important your obedience is, look at Matthew 13, 58. It says, and he, Jesus, did not many mighty works there. Talking about Nazareth. Because of their what? Unbelief. It wasn't that Jesus did not want to do mighty works. It wasn't that he wasn't willing to do them. It was that they had unbelief. Isn't that a sobering thought to think that Peter could have missed out on this incredible miracle and this life-changing event? But you know what's even more sobering to me than that as I studied this? What's even more sobering to me to think that Peter could have missed out is the, is the sobering thought that, that we could miss out on mighty things that Christ wants to do through us because of our own unbelief and disobedience to God's Word. So what am I saying? It's real simple. When Christ asks you to do something, do it. Don't hesitate. Obey and do it. You say, but Pastor Dan, it's scary. Do it. But Pastor Dan, it's deep water. Do it. Like Nike says, just do it. (laughs) You know, God deals with your heart about driving the bus for the kids and bringing kids in to hear about Jesus like Clint talked about last week. Last week, Pastor Clint, and you're thinking about it, you're on that edge, you know, you're, you're, you're in the boat, and you're like, should I, should I? Just do it. You know, God deals with your heart to help Pastor Rob with the teens, and you want to impact teenagers. Just do it. You know, God deals with your heart about doing an outreach or helping with an outreach. I had a lady call this week, wanted to do an outreach to a specific group in our community, and she's like, I'm going to do it. God says, I want you to get in a, a Bible Institute class. Do it. Uh, Maybe God's dealing with your heart about training for ministry work. Do it. Do it. Hey. Do it. Do it. Do it. You know, I mean, it's like this week. uh, Pastor Clint called one of our members who's extremely uh, gifted and, and, and very tied into the community with sports, our local community here talking to him about a sports outreach, and the guy's like, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. Let's launch out. Let's do it. Let's reach boys and girls for Christ. Let's do it. You see, the deep represents our obedience to Christ, right? Isn't that where Christ wanted Peter in the deep? That the deep represented his obedience. 
That was the place of God's will for Peter in that moment. There was no need for him to fear because that was God's place for him. Just like there's no need for you to fear that place in your life. Uh, there, there's a testimony I wanted to have. I'm going to have Robbie Hallett come up. Robbie is my assistant here in the, at Crossroads, and he's been on our staff now about a year and a half. But Robbie had a really big decision to make about a year and a half ago, and um, I want him to share that with you, his decision to launch out. Listen to this. Thank you, Pastor Dan, and good morning, church. So like you said, I, I've been on staff for just over a year and a half, but uh, prior to that, um, I was in public education, both Volusia County and in Flagler counties for six years, so 2009 to July 2015. And uh, in, as I embarked to do that, my second year of education, the administra administrative staff came to me and they asked me to join their, their, their team, their administrative team, as a teacher on assignment. And so I had a couple days and, and I, I ended up making that decision to join the team. And, but from there I knew that if I'm going to advance in this career, uh, I've got I've to get an advanced degree. I've got to get a master's degree. So I pursued that, and I received that in 2013. Um, but prior to starting that master's, I had already started the Bible Institute. And if you've ever got an advanced degree, it takes a lot of time and commitment to do that. So I had to, I had to stop for a little bit. But right when it was done, picked it right back up, and I, I did the Bible Institute. I finished that in June 2015. And I, and I do want to say this before, um, with that is, uh, I desired full-time ministry before my first day as a teacher. Uh, I just didn't know how that happened, what that looked like. And so uh, when I um, finished the Bible Institute in 2015, uh, that was June. In July, I get a call from Pastor Dan. Personal call. I don't, I don't know how many of you guys get those, but it was unexpected to me. So, and he said, hey, you know, I, um, church tonight, I wonder what time you normally get here. And I told him, and he said, I want you to chat with you. Uh, if you could come, and I'm thinking, you know, chat, right? Five, 15 minutes. I said, what time do you want me to be there? Five, 15. I'm like, church is at six. That's a long time, you know? And so I'm like, that's not a chat. You know, that's something, I don't know what that is, but that's not a chat. And so, um, so I had no clue. And so I went and met with Pastor Dan, and that's, that's the day, the very day, that he asked me to join him and, and the Crossroads team as his assistant. And so um, a few days later, um, I did accept, but I will say this, it was not easy. In fact, uh, I, was, I was really, really close, and I think I was probably more bent than 50-50 to say, Pastor Dan, I really want to do this, because I did, but I don't think I'm financially ready to do this. I'm like, if I can just get this one more year, I'm going to have this much, and then I can pay this off, and, and so I had to make a decision, because uh, he, he needed a decision, you know, and he's got, he's got, a, he's got a, the church to run, and so... Um, we did that. But here's the thing. If, if I would have done that, and he, if, he would have, if he would have done that, then wait a year for me, and he wouldn't. I know he wouldn't. Uh, but if he would have done that, I got a, I got a text just a year, uh, almost a year after I joined the staff from the administrator that I worked with saying, hey, so-and-so, the AP that was here, he's, he took a principalship, and if you would have been here, you'd be an administrator. So here's the thing. If I would have made that decision to, 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 to stay one more year away from ministry, full-time ministry, and if he would have waited, now I would have been faced with, am I going to go into ministry like I committed to, to the Lord and to what I, my word was to Pastor Dan, or am I going to take like a, almost a $12,000 pay increase? Because I got to take care of my family. So what I do? I launched out. And so, and I am, uh, I am excited to say that I, I really believe that I made... Uh, the right decision. Now, I still don't know. I think there's other launching out points, but I did make that commitment. I'm so excited that I did. So thank you, Pastor Dan. Isn't that great, church? Let's give him a hand. That's awesome. <laughs> launched out, man. You launched out. I am so thankful he did launch out. You know, as we look at Peter here and that command to launch out, and Peter's obedient, I want you to notice quickly three things about his obedience. Number one is it was prompt. There was no delay in launching out. Like Robbie said, it had been so easy to say, Pastor Dan, give me a year. No, he was prompt. Peter was prompt. Number two, it was visible. Everybody's on the shore watching what Peter's going to do. And Christ wants our faith and he wants our service to be public. He wants it to be visible to other people. I wonder how many people trusted Christ that day because of Peter's obedience. <laughs> we don't know, but we know James and John did. But your obedience affects others. And then one more thing. Number three, his obedience was complete. 
It says in verse 6, when they had this done. In other words, they did exactly what Christ told them to do. And if I could, just for a moment, digress. And could I speak to our parents? Those of you that still have children at home, I speak to you as a fellow parent. And I want to, I want to say to you parents that, there, that you, you really, really need to teach your children obedience. And don't settle for anything less than complete obedience. You say, why is that so important? Because one day they'll no longer be under your roof and they'll no longer be under your authority. It'll be them and God. And when it's just them and God, they are probably going to respond to God the same way that they have been used to responding to you. And if the obedience isn't there, and if they put you off and they don't obey immediately and they're not prompt and you don't make it complete and you don't insist on that obedience, then when they're out on their own and it's them and God, they're going to treat God that way too. And I know many adults today struggle with this thing of obeying God, launching out, doing what God wants them to do. And they struggle with it because they weren't made to obey as a child. And now in adulthood, that's affected them. You're shaping and you're molding a human life to be in a relationship with God. And this is such a key, important issue. You say, well, I want them to obey, but they won't cooperate. I know. But you know what? Thank God for stubborn parents. Amen? who are more stubborn than the child, and says, no, you will obey. You will obey. Because I'm training you to have a relationship with God one day. If we're going to launch out into deep waters, if we're going to see God do mighty things through us, it takes a heart of obedience. But number three, last thing is this, is it's going to take a heart of sacrifice. I want you to notice verse 11 after you write that in. Go to verse number 11, church, and look at that. It says, And when they had brought their ships to land, they, look at this, verse 11, they forsook what, church? All and followed him. Do you understand that that fish was not a hobby for them? This was their business? You understand, this was the greatest day they had ever had in the fishing business. That fish did not just represent food. That fish represented an incredible amount of money in the marketplace. But they left it all behind, and they gave it up in order to serve Jesus Christ. Now, what's the lesson? If we are going to walk, if we're going to go deeper in our walk with Jesus Christ, we have to be given wholly over to Him. Partial commitment to Christ is not commitment at all. Commitment equals sacrifice. That's an important statement. Say that with me. Commitment equals sacrifice. It's kind of like if you're coaching a team, which I have done many times, and you're coaching a team, and one of the players comes up to you on the team and says, Coach, I want you to know I am partially committed to this team. And as a coach, you go, okay, so what does that mean? You're partially committed. He says, I want you to know I am going to be at half of the practices, and I'm going to be at 75% of the games. In fact, I'm even going to be at the Friday night games if I don't have a date. As a coach, you would say, you are not partially committed. You are uncommitted to this team. But if a player says to you, Coach, I am committed to the team, and I'm going to be at every practice, and I'm going to be 30 minutes early, and I'm going to stay 30 minutes after every practice to work on the things that I need to be working on, and I'm making a commitment, I am going to practice individually on the days when the team does not practice. Now, that's commitment. Why? Because there's sacrifice involved. When we are completely committed to Christ there's going to be sacrifice involved. Yes, Robbie did take a pay cut. And, and he took a more substantial one than he thought he took based upon what happened the next summer and the position he could have had. 
But when we're completely committed to Christ, there's always sacrifice. That's true in any area of life, by the way. Um, You take marriage. When you marry somebody, you make a commitment. And commitment equals what? Sacrifice. Now, a lot of young people going into marriage don't get that. And you see a lot of young people that are going into marriage and they're just giddy and they're like, I'm going to get married. This is going to be fun. (laughs) This is going to be fun. This is going to fix everything in my life. All my problems are going to go away. I'm getting married, man. This is going to be fun. (laughs) This is going to be fun. Those of us who have been married for a while <laughs> laugh under our breath, or we may, if we know them well enough, even say to them, yes, there will be fun moments, <laughs> and there will be fun times, but guess what? There will be sacrifice, because no longer is it just about you. You are leaving and cleaving to one person. You're becoming one. So it's no longer just about when you want to come home at night. It's no longer just about who you want to go out with. It's no longer about what you want to eat, what you want to watch on TV, what you want to do on your day off. It's no longer just about you. You are one with someone else. And there will be sacrifice. Christ loved the church Right? He said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Sacrifice. Any area of your life, and by the way, I'll say this one more thing about marriage. A lot of marriage problems are because two people get married and they still want to live like they're single. It's a big problem in marriage. Is they don't realize that marriage is a call to leave your singlehood. And a lot, of, a lot of guys want to still go out with the guys when they want to go out with the guys. They want to do what they want to do. They want to pursue the hobbies they like and that they've always been used to pursuing. Uh, they want to, you know, uh, do the schedule of their life that they want to keep. And they don't realize that, no, marriage is a call to leave your singlehood. And now you sacrifice happily for that person you love. And... Anything in life that you're going to excel at requires commitment, which equals sacrifice. I don't care if it's relationships. If it's going to be, hey, it's going to be good. If you're going to excel in that relationship, it's going to be commitment and sacrifice. I don't care if it's a job. I don't care if it's a sport. Commitment, which equals sacrifice. Why do you, why do you, so, you know, and this is the thing. If, if we see it in relationships, and we know that, we see it in our job, we know if I'm going to excel, i got to be committed and willing to sacrifice. If we see that in sports, why in the world cannot we see that if we're going to excel in our walk with Christ, that it's going to take sacrifice? Now, please understand, there's a thrill and there's a blessing that comes in those deep waters, but it doesn't come without sacrifice and inconvenience. You, you know what? If you're committed to Christ and you're obedient, you're going to be inconvenienced. It's not always going to be convenient to serve Christ. In your handout, it says that this wasn't a convenient time for Peter to serve the Lord and to loan his boat out. In in number one, he was busy, right? He'd been washing his nets. Great excuse, right? He was busy. Number two, he was tired. He toiled all night. He'd been up all night. Number three, he was discouraged. He caught nothing, (laughs) I'm sure he was not in the best of moods when Christ asked for his help, but he did not allow the discouraging circumstances to keep him from serving Christ. Uh, What's my point? Here's my point. Opportunities to serve Christ are not always convenient. Deep, and I made this statement this morning, and and I'm going to say it again. Deep water commitment and deep water obedience will probably entail deep water sacrifice. But isn't that what love is all about? I mean, Peter loved Jesus. He did. He loved him. And you know, I, I was, here it is. I, um, I, I had Rob, Robbie let me use his fishing net. This is a pretty cool. It's got the weights and all that. And this is a real fishing net you would use out to catch fish. And you know what hit me as I was studying this passage is that Peter laid down his net twice. That net represented Peter's life. 
It really did. If you were to try to just come up with a symbol of Peter's life, it would be his fishing net. That was Peter. That's all he had ever known. That was his business. That was his livelihood. That was how he supported his family. This was Peter. And twice Jesus asked him to lay down his net. The first time he laid down his net for Jesus was out in the deep. When Jesus said out in the deep, now let down your net. And Peter, who'd already cleaned it, but yet he laid it down in obedience, which is the first point we talked about today, to Christ. There's a cord that they hold on to to pull it back in. And I'm sure Peter cast it down like Jesus said, but kept the cord in hand so that he could pull it back in, right? But then when he gets to land, he's looking at the net. He watches Jesus get out of the boat and begin to walk away. And Peter makes a decision. And he laid down his net a second time. And it caught to his coat. I know. <laughs> he got on my button. He, ca he cast it down a second time. But this time he didn't hold on to the cord. This time he cast it down, not just in obedience, but in sacrifice. He forsook all and followed Jesus Christ. God wants to take you into deeper waters. Are, are, you, are you happy with your Christian life right now? Are you satisfied? Do you think it's vibrant? Do you think it's full of joy? Do you, think, do you feel that you're really in deep waters with Christ right now? That's what God wants to do. He wants to take you into deeper waters with Him. He wants to take our church into deeper waters. And, and I'm convinced and I am very much determined that we are going to go into deeper waters as a church with Christ. But it's going to take commitment and it's going to take obedience and it's going to take sacrifice. Jesus Christ lived on this earth and he impacted so many lives. Do you know why he impacted so many lives because of the three things we saw in Peter's life, the same three things. If you look at the screen, notice the three things. Why did Christ's life make such an impact? Number one, he was totally, say the word, what? Committed. That was last week's point. He was committed to making a way of salvation for us. Are you glad for that? Amen, church? But number two, it didn't just stop there. His commitment, therefore, led him to be totally what? Obedient to the Father's plan, which number three caused him to what? Sacrificed his very life on the cross. In your handout, it says, Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. There's a picture I want to bring up of a man by the name of Jim Elliott. This young man was a missionary in Ecuador he decided to try to launch out into the deep and he had a, with four other men, they reached out to a jungle uh, tribal people there in Ecuador and at 28 years old, he was martyred. His wife ended up continuing the work and reaching these people along with others for Christ and that tribe ended up all getting saved. 28 years old, sharp young man. But Jim Elliott made this statement, and he's very known for this statement. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And I want you to pray hard this week. I want you to really pray hard about this thought. Stepping it up a little bit in 2017. Stepping it up, getting off the shore and launching out and, and, and really saying, Lord, I want to step it up this year. I want to step it up. Lord, 
Take me into deeper waters with you. Lord, show me the areas where I need to be more committed. I want, I'm serious. That, that's basically what I want you to do this week is I want you to take the message and I want you to pray through it this week. And I want you to say, Lord, where, what are some areas I need to be more committed? What are some areas I need to be more obedient? What are some areas I need to be more sacrificial for you? Lord, show me. Because I want to have impact like you did. And I want to head out into those deep waters with you.